you and Mrs. Lawrence went to Switzerland. With your little daughter. You returned to London without your little daughter. Was it because your child had been kidnapped? In 1962, While the Birds was in post-production, legendary film director Alfred Hitchcock sat down for a series of interviews with the French New Wave director Francois Truffaut to discuss his decades-long career. At some point, the subject of The Man Who Knew Too Much arose, a title and basic plot that Hitchcock would have the opportunity to film twice, first in 1934 and then in 1956. When Truffaut commented that he felt the remake improved on the original, Hitchcock candidly replied, Let's say the first version is the work of a talented amateur, and the second was made by a professional. Since then, movie lovers have debated whether this assessment is accurate, with many, including Hitchcock biographer Donald Spottle, appreciating the slickness of the 1956 Hollywood adaption with its on-location filming, Bernard Herrmann's score, and film icons James Stewart and Doris Day. However, some, including Academy Award-winning Guillermo del Toro and most British critics, will vouch for the original, with its use of black humour, tight structure, concise pacing, and the captivating performance of Peter Lorre as the charismatic villain, Abbott. Both films are well-made and captivating in their own right, with notable differences that make them both a must-watch for any Hitchcock fan. However, I would argue the 1934 version is the more significant in the development of the suspense genre and British cinema, as well as the career of the celebrated director. Hitchcock had been touted as one of Britain's most dynamic film directors since the release of The Lodger in 1927, and this notion was cemented when he directed the first British talkie with 1929's Blackmail. However, Hitchcock's career appeared to be on the wane in the preceding years, with a cluster of commercial failures. After the success of The Lodger, British International Pictures managed to get Hitchcock under contract, making him the highest paid director in Britain. The union had initially been fruitful, reaching its zenith with blackmail, but afterwards Hitchcock was given a series of unsuitable projects, whether he wanted them or not. These range from stagnant stage adaptions to upper-class family dramas and even a biographical operata about Johann Strauss that Hitchcock would latterly tell Truffaut was the lowest ebb of his career. At this point, an old friend, one-time producer and founder of Gaumont Studios, Michael Balkin, had heard how disenfranchised Hitchcock had felt at British International and offered him a new contract with Gaumont British. Hitchcock agreed almost immediately. The young screenwriter Charles Bennett, who Hitchcock had previously worked with on blackmail, was brought on board as they developed what was planned to be a bulldog drumming story. Bennett would prove to be a valuable colleague for the director and would contribute scripts for some of Hitchcock's most celebrated works in Britain. These include The 39 Steps, Sabotage, Secret Agent, Young and Innocent, foreign correspondent and saboteur. As a side note, Bennett would latterly go to Hollywood, writing The Big Circus, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, Five Weeks in a Balloon, as well as the first James Bond screen adaptation of Casino Royale in 1954, all featuring a certain Peter Lorre. In the meantime, Hitchcock and Bennett along with Hitchcock's wife Alma, associate producer Ivor Montagu, and Angus McPhail, the studio's head of screenplays, threw about ideas at the Hitchcock family home in London. It was a relaxed atmosphere with Hitchcock wearing his pyjamas or the group taking regular jaunts around the city. 
In this upbeat environment, the original Bulldog Drummond story fell by the wayside as Hitchcock recalled an idea that he and Alma had first thought up on their honeymoon several years before in the Alpine resort of Sam Moritz. Within weeks, a script had been prepared and Michael Balkin greenlit The Man Who Knew Too Much for a 10-week shoot starting on the 24th of May, 1934. The plot would revolve around what would become a standard component in Hitchcock's films, an average everyman embroiled in a dangerous situation, often through no fault of his own. With the man who knew too much, it's fully realised, with much of the suspense built from the central characters, a, a relatable and likeable family caught up in an explosive assassination plot. In the roles of Bob and Jill Lawrence were Leslie Banks and Edna Best. Bess was mostly recognised for her theatrical work and the few screen melodramas she appeared in with her then-husband, Herbert Marshall. Leslie Banks had starred in both The West End and on Broadway when he made his first credited film appearance as the deranged Count Zaroff in The Most Dangerous Game. Somewhat underrated today, Banks had an interesting varied career, managing to play heroes and villains with equal luster. During World War I, Banks had received facial injuries, severely scarring and paralysing one side of his face. In the 1920s, this could have ended an acting career, yet Banks utilised this to his advantage, using one side of his face to play light, romantic, comedic roles and the other, scarred side, to portray sinister, tragic or more dramatic characters. This is quite evident in one of my favourite Banks performances, Squire Oliver Wilsford in 1942's Wait the Day Well, who initially is charming and respectable, but we learn as a treacherous fifth colonist. 14-year-old Nova Pilbeam had made her film debut earlier in the year with Little Friend. The young performer impressed audiences so much that she would later be cast in leading roles such as Lady Jane Grey and Erica in Hitchcock's Young and Innocent. When Hitchcock went to Hollywood and made Rebecca, producer David O. Selznick wanted Pilbeam for the lead though that role would eventually go to Joan Fontaine. Pillbeams never went to Hollywood. Her career lasted until she turned 30. She would meet her first husband on The Man Who Knew Too Much Is Set and would continue to give interviews about her film experiences until she died in 2015. Peter Laurie had caught the attention of international movie audiences for his stunning performance in Fritz Lang's M. After going on to have a few supporting roles in Germany, Laurie would hastily and prudently flee to Paris as the Nazis came to power. While there, Laurie battled his morphine addiction, appeared in a small role in a G.W. Pabs film, and waited for his situation to improve. Ivor Montague, Hitchcock's associate producer, had been an early advocate for German Expressionism and along with Sidney Bernstein, he had founded the London Film Society in 1924. Both were also members of the Committee for the Victims of German Fascism. When he heard that Laurie was in Paris, Montague was in the perfect position to bring the young actor over to the UK. Montague would later say, There was never any question about his coming over to be inspected or tested. Even his English was not in question, for a German accent was no obstacle in the part. He came over not to be approved, but to be engaged. It was perhaps advantageous that Peter's English was not in question, as according to Laurie, the only English words he knew were yes and no. When he met Hitchcock, he thought it best to say yes to everything and aware of the director's raucous sense of humour, laughed hysterically at everything he said. Initially assigned the role of the assassin, Hitchcock quickly opted to give the more comprehensive role of the criminal mastermind, Abbott, to Laurie. It's debatable how quickly Laurie learnt English and how new he was to the language. Some viewers believe that he was merely parroting his lines phonetically. However, he delivers his dialogue with pitch-perfect contemplation, nuance and pacing. <laughs> Ah, here he is again. Officer, this gentleman is reading a great travel tonight. Nothing of the kind, officer. My pal has a little girl. 
At least he hasn't now. That's the whole point. He came down here to look for her. And these chaps, I, I mean this fellow here, that they're, they're crooks officer. He's a little intoxicated officer. The, I, I... His friend was paid enough, but he's worse, isn't he, sister? He's constantly creating scenes in his church. I should look here, the pair of you. Disorderly behavior and a sacred edifice. Is that what we want to charge you with? No, no. Alas, yes. Uh, we don't wish to press it, officer, but, uh, but we've been very patient, haven't we, sister? Peter's first performance in English was actually the recently discovered English dub for M, where sections of his performance were reshot. Now, this performance is slower, clunkier, and contains several more cuts. Yeah, what do you know of these things? You, you criminals who earn your living by stealing, thieving, and car chopping. It's your daily life, your bread. But as for me, I am cursed. I am cursed. I can't help it. I tell you, I, I can't help it. Stories from behind the scenes of The Man Who Knew Too Much have become legendary amongst Hitchcock's fans. The director and Peter Laurie had a rowdy sense of humour in common and fondness for practical jokes. According to Hitchcock biographer Donald Spotto, when Peter got a new suit and complained that the dust from the studio ruined it, Hitchcock admonished him for behaving like a child. Days later, Laurie received an infant-sized replica of the suit. It is also claimed that Hitchcock sent a horse to Laurie's flat, where it proceeded to eat furniture and defecate everywhere. Laurie would strike back by sending 50 canaries to Hitchcock's home. Perhaps this was an inspiration for Melanie Daniels nearly three decades later. The authenticity of these stories are questionable, but one event did happen. A few days before turning 30, Laurie hastily left the studio, leapt in a taxi in full costume and grotesque makeup, and went to the registry office to marry his long-term girlfriend, Celia Lofsky. They immediately returned to the studio after the ceremony, where Hitchcock chastised them in jest for living in sin for years. The Man Who Knew Too Much opens in St. Moritz, Switzerland, on a ski slope with admittedly clunky back projection, which does seem awkward and dated even by the standards of the time. To avoid a young girl chasing her dog, the skier accidentally skids into a crowd of onlookers. As they pick themselves up, we are introduced to our protagonist. We realise the skier is Louis Bernard, who knows the girl, Betty, and her parents, Bob and Jill Lawrence. In the crowd is a jovial German man who unsuccessfully tries to distract the teenage Betty with his chiming watch and loudly proclaims his English is bad a detail that was possibly added to reflect Laurie's real-life predicament. The opening moments of the film are upbeat and comical. This is an early example of what Hitchcock would repeatedly do throughout his career, use comedy as a misdirection before things make a dramatic shift. Rewatching the film recently, I was struck by how progressive the Lawrences are, especially comparing it to the remake. James Stewart and Doris Day fit the 1950s conservative American ideal, with Day's character having given up her successful singing career for the role of wife and mother. The reason the Lawrences are in Samaritz is so Jill can take part in a shooting competition. Jill is a witty, self-possessed and confident woman. The Lawrences and Louis partake in banter filled with flirtation and innuendo. I'm just going off with another man. <laughs> Darling, you go to bed early with Betty. <laughs> Poor Daddy. There is a refreshing merriment, wit and understanding in this marriage. The relationship with young Betty is the same. They affectionately call her a pest and brat. Jill gently admonishes her for distracting her while taking a shot. However, the Lawrences treat their daughter with a surprising amount of respect. The family acts as a unit and is pleasant to watch without any of the saccharine sentimentality of the remake. Despite the brief time Nova Pilbeam is on screen, she is excellent. Her character is surprisingly precocious for this period, but it is a trait that undoubtedly helps her deal with her traumatic situation. 
As Louis and Jill dance, Will intertwines all the revelers on the dance floor, thanks to a prank Bob plays. Suddenly, everything changes. There's confusion as we hear a window break. Louis is startled and calmly looks down to see his blood-stained shirt. His death is subdued. Nobody but Jill seems aware of what has occurred as he whispers instructions to her. Annoyingly, he tells Jill to get Bob to retrieve information from his room. I say annoyingly because up to this point, Jill has proved to be more capable than Bob and Edna Best isn't left with much to do until the final act. I can't help but feel they should get out of this awful predicament together, like Hanny and Pamela do in The 39 Steps, or the McKennas in The 56 Remake. What transpires is that their newfound friend is a spy and the Lawrences have stumbled upon information that will ultimately lead to the assassination of a foreign dignitary in London. However, Jill and Bob realise too late that the killers have kidnapped Betty to guarantee their silence. Admittedly, the pace does slow in an expositional scene involving the police when the Lawrences return to London. However, intrigue is restored with the unexpected cut to a giant grotesque set of false teeth where we are treated to an absurd yet thrilling scene involving a crooked dentist. Here we are reintroduced to the jovial German, Abbott from Samaritz, who turns out to be the mastermind behind the assassination plot as well as Betty's kidnapping. Laurie's performance is mesmerizing. This was Laurie's introduction to conventional English speaking audiences. His striking image was used for the marketing of the film and definitely helped when Laurie travelled to Hollywood in the coming months. Abbott is genial, enjoys a laugh. However, the charm is deceptive. Abbott is ruthless and incredibly dangerous. And tell Mrs Lawrence, her little Betty and her husband are very well. Anything else? Tell her they may soon be leaving us. Leaving us for a long, long journey. How is it that Shakespeare says, from which no traveller returns? Great poet. Oh, Daddy! Daddy! Let me go! Daddy! But in a rare moment of anger, Abbott stares down Bob before smacking him on the head, and he immediately apologises for losing his cool. Despite this unconventional intimidation, there are some unexpected, subtle moments of humanity, such as when Betty is ripped away from her father. This is business, not personal. During the final shootout, Abbott remains unruffled until the moment his mysterious loyal nurse and partner, Agnes, is shot. His demeanour changes, holding her with tender grief. It's a small melancholic moment where Abbott's eyes seem to ask, how did it come to this? Modern audiences may feel alienated by the emotional restraint of the central characters. I say you mustn't get jumpy, you know. Really, you mustn't. What I mean to say is, uh, well, once you begin that sort of thing, uh, lose grip and... Uh, and... <laughs> I know. I'm all right. Darling! Betty! <laughs> I say, darling, <clears throat> you're for smart dressing gown. Where'd you get it? Hmm? Oh. Betty. It's very British stiff up her lip. This sentiment is apparent throughout the film and it primarily allows Hitchcock to indulge and develop his love for black comedy, an understatement, speaking with frankness. Critic James Shelley Hamilton wrote in the National Board of Review, One of the striking things about the picture is the way grimness and terror are heightened by pitching the acting in a low key. Nothing is done violently or loudly. A careful style of understatement achieves in the sum total a remarkably gripping force. Hitchcock effectively built suspense as we reach the climax of the film. It was already typical for Hitchcock to employ a well-known landmark as a set piece and he famously used the Royal Albert Hall. Jill is instructed to go there to warn the assassin's target. She recognises Ramon, her shooting companion in Samaritz. 
and he presses Betty's brooch into her hand. She goes into the auditorium. We are unsure what she is going to do. Hitchcock commissioned Arthur Benjamin to write The Storm Clouds Catata, a diegetic piece that builds tension. What we, the spectator, know that Jill, nor anyone else at the Albert Hall do, that Ramon is to shoot when the music crescendos. This is Hitchcock developing his ideas around vicarious suspense. Hitchcock has given us the necessary information via Abbott earlier. Now we have a montage to build the tension. Jill sits in the auditorium, scared, uncertain and exhausted. Her gaze goes from box to box, cut to the target, then the orchestra. We are reminded of the stakes when Jill looks at the brooch. The music reaches its crescendo, but Jill manages to emit a scream of warning. This is a perfectly paced, well-acted build-up of suspense, and it really is the inception of Hitchcock's big climatic set pieces that we would see throughout his career. The final shootout was based on the 1911 siege of Sydney Street, where a Latvian gang were in an armed standoff with police that resulted in the deaths of three police officers and the gang leader. I also believe the film is visually reminiscent of the final scenes from Fritz Lang's 1922 film, Dr. Mubusa Inferno. These final moments are a little dragged out in The Man Who Knew Too Much. In a lengthy sequence, we cut to two police officers moving into position where we see the banter between them as they negotiate with a member of the public to borrow his flat and they move furniture before one is shot dead. It feels as if Hitchcock was trying to give personality to a victim rather than just have him killed unceremoniously. And this is quite unusual for the period, but unfortunately it just slows the action. The sequence ends with Betty escaping onto the roof, pursued by Raymond. In a moment of inspiration, Jill grabs a gun off a police officer, takes aim and shoots him off the roof, ultimately proving that she is more effective than Bob. The police invade Abbott's den to find the gang dead, though Abbott's position behind the door is given away when his watch chimes. Knowing the game is up, we hear a gun. A wisp of gun smoke rises, and upon closing the door, we see Abbott, gun in hand, sink to the ground, dead. Over the years, The Man Who Knew Too Much has been dismissed as a creaky relic of British cinema, a shadow of its glossier, stellar remake decades later. However, the film set the ball rolling for Hitchcock, laying the groundwork for his later movies. The film is not Hitchcock's best. It's not even his best British film. However, I genuinely believe it's a fascinating glimpse of what was to come for director and star ultimately leading both men to Hollywood by the end of the decade.